If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Genesis 22. We're taking a break from our study of 2 Peter for this Easter Sunday and looking at a passage, uh, a story that you're very familiar with. Um, Abraham offering Isaac and how this story is so appropriate for Easter because it points us to the sacrifice that God would make with his son 2,000 years later. And uh, there's a lot of parallels which I hope we'll see as we go along here. So we're going to be looking at the first 14 verses of Genesis 22. So let me begin, I uh, ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Let's, let's pray together. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Amen. Well, at Easter time, uh, Christians all over the world are gathering and celebrating uh, God's provision for man's sin. That's what Easter is all about. And one of the most captivating pictures of God's provision is found in this story we're looking at this morning. Abraham <clears throat> being asked of God to offer up his son Isaac. F.B. Meyer wrote these words, so long as men live in the world, they will turn to this story with unwaning interest. There is only one scene in history by which it is surpassed. That where the great father gave his Isaac to a death from which there was no deliverance. James Montgomery Boyce said this, Abraham's near sacrifice of his son Isaac is pageant and prophecy of the actual sacrifice by God of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on Calvary. It shows the love, not the cruelty, of God. Indeed, Genesis 22 is the first passage since Genesis 3.15 in which we are pointed to the love and provision of God for guilty sinners through Christ's crucifixion. Well, the account begins in Genesis 22 with the command to Abraham to offer his son. Look at the first couple of verses. <clears throat> now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now this is a test for Abraham. God doesn't tempt us, right? James tells us as much but he does test us. Now, <clears throat> God's purpose is always to build us up. Unlike Satan's purpose, which is always to tear us down. In this test, Abraham's earthly love for his son is put in conflict with his love for God and obedience to God. I don't know if you've ever had a conflict like that. How would you handle it? How would I handle it? Imagine if we were tested, how would we respond? Well, notice the time of this test in verse 1. It says, now it came about after these things. Well, what are these things? Well, <clears throat> prior to this test, there were at least nine great trials, tests, if you will, in Abraham's life, like leaving his home at a ripe old age. God doesn't begin by giving him the big test, but he prepares him. He gives him other tests 
along the way, opportunity to build the spiritual muscles in his faith before he gives them this test. <clears throat> Perhaps we can better feel the magnitude of this test when we understand some of the context in which it came to Abraham. God had promised to make him into a great nation, specifically through Isaac. Uh, we read about that back in chapter 17 of Genesis. And Isaac came to Sarah and Abraham long after their childbearing years. Right? He was a child of promise. God had told Abraham that Isaac would live, that he would marry, that he would have a family, and so forth. And now, God tells him to sacrifice Isaac. Perhaps for the first time in his experience with God, there's a conflict for him between what God had promised and now what God is commanding him or asking him to do. Again, how is Abraham going to deal with this conflict? How's it going to be resolved? How would we deal with it? Well, there's really only a couple of ways that he could handle it. One, Abraham could have concluded that God was erratic, that he was wavering back and forth between plans because he didn't know in his own mind what he really wanted to do. But you see, that was not in keeping with Abraham's experience of God. For one thing, his long wait for Isaac had taught him that God was not like that. God was not erratic, that what God does promise, he does. Well, the other option for Abraham was that although he was unable to see a resolution at the time of the difficulty <clears throat> or conflict in his mind, God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy to have a resolution and that he would disclose it in his perfect time. Now that was probably the harder of the two options for Abraham. But it was in keeping with his experience of God that led him in that direction. He left the difficulty of understanding the situation with God, in God's hands. And that's what we've got to do. That's what we may have to do at certain times. This is the true essence of faith. See, when we face testing, when we face trials, whether great or small, we have to keep in mind that ultimately God has a solution. Even if we can't see it, even if we don't understand it at the time, we have to understand that God is after our hearts. See, his purpose is always to build us up, not to tear us down. God was after Jacob's heart, right? When he wrestled with him and left him a limp the rest of his life. It's the same with us, all of God's testing is for good, to build up, to strengthen faith. This test, I think, is especially hard for Abraham uh, <clears throat> because of his love for Isaac. It says in verse 2, whom you love, and that Isaac was his only son. Now, in what sense? He had other sons, right? In what sense was he his only son? Well, he was the only son born of Sarah. And the promise of God was to be fulfilled through him. He was the child of promise. How does Abraham respond? Well, look at verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which he had told him. Notice how promptly uh, Abraham obeys God's command, what God tells him to do. Abraham rose early in the morning. He doesn't delay. Now that's challenging. 
How often does our delayed obedience really become disobedience? Abraham takes three people with him, <clears throat> Isaac and the two young men. Notice also the time period they traveled before they reached the mountain where he was to offer up Isaac. Look at verse four. <clears throat> On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. So it's a three-day journey. Again, you're beginning to see some parallels here. There were three men on the cross at Christ's crucifixion. Abraham took three men. <clears throat> Jesus rose on the third day. It was a three-day journey. And there's more. The mountain that Abraham takes Isaac to is in the land of Moriah, it tells us. Well, Moriah is mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, which says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Jerusalem is identified with Mount Moriah, and Mount Calvary is located there as well. And many people believe that the mountain that Isaac took, or Abraham took Isaac to, was the same mountain where God would offer his son 2,000 years later. Here's what Dr. Boyce says. This was the place God intended to build his city and in which he intended to have his own son die. This explains why he had Abraham make the three-day journey to get there. God was showing that it was on this mountain, Jerusalem or Mount Moriah, that he would see to our salvation. That's amazing, isn't it? Abraham offers Isaac on the same mountain that God sacrifices his son on. Well, next we see the promise Abraham makes to the two young men <clears throat> when they get to the mountain. Look at verse 5. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. He says, We will return to you. Okay, and here we see Abraham working out the conflict. He must have believed in the resurrection. That God would raise Isaac, even though up to this point that had never happened before. There was no context for Abraham to believe that. He tells the men that they will return from the mountain. He believed that God would have him kill his son, but he also believed that God could raise him from the dead. Next, Abraham makes preparation, verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in, took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. Notice the one who is carrying the wood is the one that's going to be sacrificed, right? Does that bring back any parallels, anything there? that it makes you think of. And then there's a prophecy that Abraham makes that I don't think he even knew what he was doing at the time. Look at it in verses 7 and 8. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Now, think about the impact this must have had on Abraham at the time. They both proceed, and it's like Isaac says, Dad, we've got everything but the lamb. We forgot the lamb. 
What would you say? How would you respond? Abraham said, God will provide a lamb for himself. So they proceed, and when they get there, Abraham makes final preparation. Verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And again, try to envision the scene. <clears throat> Abraham turns to Isaac. He says, son, get on the wood. What, dad? Son, you are the lamb. What? You're the lamb. What do you mean, Dad? God told me to offer you as a burnt offering. God wouldn't do that, Dad. I know, but he did. That's what he asked me to do. Now, son, I know you could resist me. Isaac was of the age and of the strength where he could have resisted Abraham if he wanted to. But son, I'm asking you to get on the wood and I'm going to bind you so you can't crawl off and then I'm going to kill you with this knife and then I'm going to burn you. What does Isaac do? He complies. He complies. How did Jesus approach the cross? Well, Hebrews 12, 2 tells us, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The story continues in verses 10 to 12, Abraham stretches out his hand to slay Isaac, and suddenly there's a prohibition. Look at verse 10. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Here was proof of how much a mere man would do for the love of God. Now, it's the same first love that Christ calls you and me to. Okay, not the same test, but the same First love. Jesus said in Luke 14, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Same first love, not the same test. But even more than that, this is a picture of how much more God would do 2,000 years later as an expression of his love for sinners. See, Abraham was only asked to sacrifice his son. He didn't actually have to do it. And even if he had, there was only physical death involved. But when the time came for God to sacrifice his son, it meant both physical and spiritual death in order for him to provide redemption for us. See, the difference is when God raised his hand at Calvary, there was no voice. Stop. Don't stretch out your hand. Don't hurt the lad. Well, finally, we see God's provision, verses 13 and 14. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. 
Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. In the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. You know, the names of God are windows into his character. Here the name is the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh. In Abraham's day, God provided a lamb for a sacrifice in the place of Isaac. But what Abraham really learned on that day was that at the proper time, God would provide his own son to die for our salvation. That's why we're here today, right? That's why we're here every Lord's Day. That's why we're here. This is what Easter is all about. The Lord has provided atonement for man's sin. Well, we've seen how this account then points us to Christ in several ways. The persons involved, two young men, there were two men next to Christ on the cross. The period of time, three days journey to the place that God told Abraham to go. Christ is in the tomb three days. And the place, a mountain in the land of Moriah where Mount Calvary is. But we've also seen where this resemblance breaks down, right? When God got ready to offer his son, as we said, there was no voice that said stop. Why was that? Well, because there's no substitute for the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament were designed to point to Jesus and to teach the people and to teach us the principle of substitution. That a substitute was needed to atone for our sin. That without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There was none other good enough to pay the price of sin. He alone could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Well might the son of darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. God tested Abraham on this day and Abraham's faith proved to be genuine. And God will test us if we're Christians because he loves us. Maybe you are going through something like that right now. Maybe you feel that you're being tested even today as we're here. <clears throat> Is there something you need to put on the altar? Something that you've put in front of the Lord in your life. It could be a position. It could be a career. It could be a possession. It could be a relationship. It could be a habit that is hurting your walk with God. Is there an Isaac you need to offer up to the Lord? The Lord will provide when we do things his way. Now, he may not provide until we take that first step of obedience like Abraham did. Once he knows what's in our hearts, he may give Isaac back. He may not. Sometimes we're not going to know until we take the step. Abraham didn't know at first. But we see the genuineness of his faith. He put God first. Sometimes faith will cost us. God must be first. Think of the many ways Abraham's faith cost him. Earlier, he had to leave his family, his hometown, his security. In other words, he had to put God in front of all those things in his life. And now here he is at the end of his life. And God tells him to put the son whom he loves dearly on the altar. 
Is there something God is calling you or me to put on the altar? God provided a lamb for Abraham. He provided a lamb for you and me too. That's what Easter is all about. God's provision for man's sin. He killed that lamb as a substitute for everyone that will come to him. See, either I'm going to pay the penalty for my sin or there's going to be a substitute. Someone else is going to pay it. What's the penalty? Well, Romans 6.23 tells us the wages, the penalty of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is provided. Have you come to the land? Is he your substitute for sin? Let's pray together. As our hearts are bowed, is there, is there an Isaac you need to put on the altar? Someone, something that has taken God's place as first in your life. Bring it to the Lord. Offer it up to him like Abraham did. See what he does. The Lord will provide. Are you listening and realize that you've never come to the Lamb of God for cleansing yourself and eternal life? You can do that right now. Pray like this silently in your heart. God, thank you for providing a sacrifice for my sin the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, right now, I ask you to come into my life to cleanse me from the guilt of my sin. Be the substitute for my sin. Give me the free gift of eternal life and from this day forward, have first place in my life. Amen. Now, if you'll stand for the benediction.